Welcome to our backyard. This is the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We are two friends having a discussion after everyone else has passed out or gone to bed. Grab a drink and listen as we discuss everything from automation, space exploration, and why the meaning of life is 42. Questions about peaceful transition of power after the election, disease running through the population, questionable economy, attacks on the media and free speech, sex scandals, small versus large federal government, foreign policy scandals, talks of civil war, backdoor deals leading to an election to decide the fate of a nation, but more realistically the world. We're going to talk about the election of 1800 today, going way back in time to the founding of the United States of America, just after it. Set the stage, the election of 1796 was was won by former Vice President John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson became the Vice President. This is important because John Adams was a Federalist. He supported a stronger central government, and Thomas Jefferson was a Democratic Republican. He wanted to be more a collection of states. There are two opposing parties. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson disagreed on almost every level about how the nation should be run, who our allies should be. They didn't exactly have political parties at this time. They were, This is in the midst of the formation of political parties. Before that, before Adams... President Adams, we had George Washington, and that was kind of a unanimous decision. The 1796 election was predominantly personalities, not really parties yet. Some could argue the election of 1800 wasn't completely a partisan election, but it was definitely the formation of the modern political party. So John Adams, like I said, wanted a stronger central government. John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, and uh, Pinckney were some of the leaders of that party. They wanted things like a navy, more of a military. If I remember correctly, Nick, they wanted a federal bank, not more independent family sl- like slash individual banks, if that makes sense. Yes, they did want a federal bank run by the government. It was one of their central ideas, really, that that was what they were going to have. And it'll be important later on. Ad- or Jefferson was vehemently against this. Jefferson is more of an agrarian. I kind of think of it as, to simplify it, The Federalists wanted the United States of America, and Jefferson wanted these United States of America. He wanted more state government decision over federal government decision. And at the time, this is a a very common debate happening in the population. Keep in mind, the Americans had not that long ago overthrown the English government, a monarchy. And as such, many Americans were afraid of a strong central power, including a president. So the United States was stronger at this time than it was during the Washington and Adams, or mostly Washington going into Adams. They had swapped out the Articles of Confederation with the Constitution that we know it today. That being said, it was not truly united as a nation yet. Setting up for the election of 1800 were a lot of variables. In 1793, yellow fever hit Virginia and several other states. James Monroe was the mayor and uh, responded well to the virus. Monroe was a Republican, Democratic Republican. I'm going to say Republican to make it shorter. Out of curiosity, Nick, was it Republican before they switched sides, Republicans, or because Republican parties switched on which side of the spectrum they're on? I would say this doesn't really apply to the any political party we have today. Uh, if I had to say the Democratic Republicans were more similar to the conservative movement of today, they wanted less federal power, more states' rights, but they wanted less of a military, which is kind of the opposite. And So it was just kind of a murky time. There was no really defined lines. Got it. Just I was just out of curiosity. Yeah. And the Federalists were, you know, they wanted a stronger central government. You could see them as the more as the Democratic parties today, but I don't really want to, that's definitely not a fair, fair assumption. Modern politics versus old politics, completely separate issues and separate, different, different animals altogether. Yeah. So it, what was funny about the yellow fever and how Monroe handled it is that Monroe as a Republican was not a fan of the strong central government. However, as governor of Virginia, he formed a strong central government in Virginia in order to address the yellow fever. He established a quarantine for incoming ships, worked with the mayors of large cities to formalize 
guidelines and keep everything coordinated so that sailors sailing into a port, any port in Virginia would have similar quarantine, similar rules. Traveling to different state cities in Virginia would do the same thing. It's just kind of funny how that's exactly the opposite of the thing he wanted, but you don't always get what you want. At the same time, as yellow fever is breaking out in the United States, violence was breaking out across the Atlantic. France had just declared war on England, even though it seems like they're in perpetual battle, and both were using the United States as a pawn in their game. The United States had just recently sold her navy after the war for independence, and it would take time and money the young government didn't have to build up to it. The United States also did not want to be dragged into another war, and John Jay was dispatched to create peace with England. Washington and the new United States government signed Jay's Treaty with England. Jay's Treaty established a limited peace with England. Due to Jay's Treaty, England removed their military around the U.S. border frontier. At this time, everything west of the colonies, the more recent United States, was owned by the French. To the south, the Spanish in Florida, and to the north was England. And they'd still get into tussles with England every now and then. So England removed some of their military on that border, and they would allow limited trade with the former colony in select ports. They also demanded that the United States would provide protection to British ships around the U.S. coastline and forbid privateers who fly under flags who oppose England from trading in the United States. The United States would also have to pay back their debts to England. So citizens of the U.S. who owed money to England before the war would have to pay that back. The Jay's Treaty was not perfect. It got hate from both sides. But the important thing is that it kept the United States out of a war for a short time. And that is what is important. That's how you know it's a good treaty is when both sides aren't happy, but at least they get something. <laughs> exactly. And the United States didn't have a lot of money at this time. U.S. citizens who had just recently fought a revolutionary war in part due to unfair taxation, really did not like getting taxed. Meanwhile, France expected the U.S. to support them in their war against England, seeing as France supported us in our war against England. They saw the Jay Treaty as a slap in the face to them. In response to the Jay Treaty, France began harassing and seizing U.S. ships, which led to what would become known as the Quasi-War. Americans were divided on the Quasi-War, which eventually led to a fistfight in Congress between old rivals on opposite sides. I do want to point out that for as much as politicians today hate each other, none of them hate each other so much and stand up for their principles so much that they'd actually get into a fistfight to defend their position. Although I'd really like to see that, to be honest with you. Oh, for sure. France was a major trade partner with the U.S., and the quasi-war led to economic issues as that they were a major trading partner and they kind of stopped trading as much or France would just take their ships. And so even though they opened up that trading with England, now they lost another trading partner. So they, they're really struggling here. Adams sent an ambassador to talk to France, but he was denied from meeting with the French. Later, in 1797, Adams sent three more delegates to meet with France. The three delegates met with Charles de Talleyrand of France, and he asked for money and an apology for the anti-French sentiment in one of Adams' speeches in exchange for consul on the war with England. Or ex in exchange for consul, as the war with England raged on and France had had a stream of victories, they began to make bolder and bolder requests of the delegates. At the time, U.S. citizens were divided on who to support. For the most part, the Federalists tended to support England and the the Democratic Republicans tended to support France. So eventually, the U.S. Congress began reading the letters that were slowly being sent back from France. The French demanding a payment in advance of their meeting with actual delegates, or the French side, and then the increased demands after the French victories did not make Congress happy. Keep in mind, it takes three months for a letter to go from France to the U.S., and then another three months for their response. I also think it's important to realize that we're le less than a decade out of the Revolutionary War. People are still wounded. People have lost limbs people are still trying to put back together families burnt down plantations like they're trying to rebuild an entire country now and that so everything's stressful let alone a letter taking three to four months to get across the atlantic and the new government had very little money not enough to pay the bribes that these countries were demanding. And all these letters were sent in code because they didn't want other people reading them, so they had to be deciphered. As the U.S. began deciphering the letters, they became enraged. The Federalists and Adams at the forefront started preparing for a war. And Jefferson, who spent some time in France, 
did not want to become involved in another war and sided more with the French. Congress passed a resolution and they released the papers from the meeting with Talleyrand. The United States did not want to release the names of the delegates in case they wanted to use them again, so their names were redacted, and instead X, Y, and Z were used. The American people were furious after reading these letters, and they demanded millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. The Republicans opposed the tax to help pay for the war that the federal government was preparing to levy to pay for the military buildup, but they had no branch and many of the branches of the government at that time. The Federalists controlled the executive branch and the legislative branch. The scandal became known as the XYZ Affair. After the XYZ Affair, Adams' popularity rose along with anti-French sentiment. Some Americans wanted to go to war, still others wanted to remain neutral. As anti-French sentiment built up across the nation, Adams used it as an opportunity to pass the Alien and Sedition Act in 1798. The Alien and Sedition Act is only applicable during wartime. The Alien Act said you had to be a resident of the U.S. for 14 years before your citizenship became official, and you could not vote until then. Previously, it was five years. The Alien Act also made it easier to deport immigrants. The Sedition Act made it illegal to speak ill of the government, president, or spread false information. The Sedition Act did not mention the vice president, because the vice president was Jefferson, who was a poli different political party than Adams, who had passed the legislation. Jefferson saw how unpopular this would be with the freedom-loving citizens and quickly put this to his advantage. It was not that long ago that the Bill of Rights was, the ink was still drying on the Bill of Rights and we just saw the government censor free speech. So Nick, before you continue, I'm a little confused. You right now, we're in a new election. Has Adams and Jefferson been elected yet? Or because you were talking about VP and president. That's why I'm curious. Sorry. So th the previous election, the 1796 election, Adams was elected and Jefferson was elected as vice president. So the way the electoral college worked at that time is the two highest people on the ticket. First highest became president. Second highest became VP. It made no difference between who was what candidate was a presidential nominee and who was a vice presidential nominee because, you know, who gets the most votes in election? The two people running for president. So in 1796, Adams became president after George Washington and Jefferson was his vice president. So we're in 1798 leading up to the election of 1800. Having two rivals, one being the president, the other being VP. Boy, is that not a sitcom in the making? I don't know what is. And I think at this point where the political differences were so big, and the, the country was so new, these people disagreed vehemently on the role of the federal government in people's lives. Compared to what these two wanted of the country, our two presidential candidates in 2020 are have more similarities than they do differences. So Jefferson, after seeing how unpopular this would be with the American citizens, decided to hire James Colander, one of the first activist journalists. Colander was famous for publishing opinions and tabloids, and he was not above writing about people's personal lives. Everyone's familiar with Alexander Hamilton. He was the one who published the papers about their his mistress, Mariah Reynolds. Hamilton is popular in popular culture today through his play, Hamil or the play about his life, Hamilton. And I haven't seen it, but I'm pretty sure this is probably the leading song from it, My Maria, which is later popularized by Brooks and Dunn. James Colander spent nine months writing The Prospect Before Us. It was in, I think it was like 52-page essay about the upcoming election. Per the Sedition Act, you cannot speak ill of the president during war times. A few days after The Prospect Before Us came out, he was promptly jailed. He was jailed for nine months and fined $200 at that time, that is a lot of money. Other newspapers that opposed Adams were also jailed. Aaron Burr, Jefferson's VP, made some of the first political pamphlets and distributed them in New York. Personally, I'm not a huge Aaron Burr fan. I think he is more similar to a modern day politician than any th anyone else in this time period, him and Hamilton. Just to let you know, Nick, around that time for a $200, around that period, today's money, is over $4,000. Yeah, that's a lot of money. And I don't know how much journalists made back then, but I doubt they made that much money. As I was saying, Aaron Burr and Hamilton were kind of the behind the scenes, organizing all the political decision, not decision making as much, more Hamilton 
than Burr making decision making. Burr was mainly focused on getting into office. Burr would do pretty much anything to, to gain more power. Like I said, he distributed some of the first political pamphlets in New York, his home state. He had others distribute them in early, uh, in what would be considered an early door-to-door -door campaign. They'd walk through the different areas in New York, knocking on doors, talking about political issues. He even opened his house. He constantly had reporters and community members come in his house, talk to him, sleep, eat there as a first, I'd say, unofficial campaign headquarters. At this time, I think it's important to mention, people really didn't campaign. It was seen as beneath someone if they're going out and campaigning. Very, I don't think Jefferson made any speeches until after he was elected, and Adams made a speech, but not about, not in a campaign sense that we would see today. And I think we might need to get back on that track. The election of 1800 would be a turning point for the country. The United States would ultimately choose Jefferson and become more, like I said, these United States of America, rather than Adams with a stronger federal government. Republic, the Democratic Republicans and the Federalists were the foundation for the two-party system in the United States. They disagreed on almost everything, including who the U.S. should side with, Britain or France. Should we have a, cent a federal bank? Foreign policy. Even if we disagreed with Britain or France, should we even get involved? As the election loomed closer, tensions continued to rise, including shouts of possible secession or civil war. If the desired leader was not chosen, many Americans who primarily identified themselves by which state they lived in, not as countrymen yet, remembered being ruled by a monarchy and a strong federal government sounded a lot like that. Especially Adams, who had a son, John Quincy, who was rising in the political arena. Once the states got their votes and sent their delegates to the Electoral College, it was decided that Jefferson and Burr won with an equal number of votes. Jefferson and Burr, at the same time, both Democratic Republicans, tied for electoral votes. There wasn't a separate column for VP like we mentioned, because we had the Adams-Jefferson combo for the 1796 election. What they primarily would do for the caucus or the Electoral College, each candidate someone would be designated a throwaway vote. So for VP, instead of voting all people who are writing in the Electoral College their vote for Burr, one of them would just put in a write-in candidate. And that way, the vice presidential candidate always got one less vote than the presidential candidate. If there's a tie in the Electoral votes, a tie moves to the House, which was controlled by the opposition at that time, the Federalists. The Federalists wanted to elect Burr, the VP, as president because he would be more sympathetic to their cause than Jefferson, who was a subject who Jefferson is currently the subject of slander and a brutal election. Burr, like I said previously, just wanted power, and he would do pretty much anything to stay in power. Jefferson had more was more principle based. He would not be easy to sway. He knew what direction he wanted to take the country, and no matter how much pressure the Federalists applied, he would not budge. However, Burr would not be as hard to convince. The House voted 35 times to try and decide the fate of who would be president, Jefferson or Burr. Each time- 35 times? 35 times they voted. Oof. Every time, it came in a tie. In the meantime, Republicans and Federalist militias began to drill. And these aren't the militias we think of today as people running around in the backyard. Who just got done with the war? These are soldiers who just got done fighting a revolutionary war. Eventually, James Baird of Delaware broke the tie. James Baird was hailed as a traitor. Delaware, being a small state, would have lost representation, or worse, lost a battle in case a civil war actually broke out. Baird got three things from an agreement with Jefferson's friends. He kept Alexander Hamilton's U.S. bank. All the Federalists working the government wouldn't be removed as revenge, as well as he kept the Navy the Federalists worked so hard to build up. Now Jefferson denied that there was a that there was a, a deal struck, but seems to lean that this is most likely is what happened and what broke. Hamilton, a Federalist, also may have had something to do with this. He was pressuring the Federalists to vote for Jefferson, saying, It's better to fight the enemy you know. Jefferson, we know where he stands, we know what his position will be. Burr, commonly being likened to a weasel, you don't know what he's gonna do. He may work with us, or he may be an even worse person to deal with than Jefferson. So they decided to go with the evil that they knew. Or it could just be that Baird was getting worried about the Civil War actually breaking out 
and worried for his state. We may never know. I mean, we're not going to get any new information unless someone brings some new letters, but it's a backdoor deal for the presidency. That being said, 200 years later, I think we can agree that it worked out for the best. James Collender, the guy who wrote the prospect before us and was jailed, he eventually got out, and he thought he was going to get a cabinet position or become postmaster general of, I think, Rhode Island. Jefferson didn't want to raise tensions anymore, did not give him any positions in the government. James Collender was upset. He then wrote about an, the affair between Jefferson and his slave Sally Hemings. We know now that that definitely happened, and Jefferson denied it every time, and he never spoke about it. Adams was furious to lose the election to Jefferson. Before he got out of office, he quickly added Federalist judges to several federal courts, including John Marshall, who later became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. John Marshall's widely recognized as one of the greatest chief marshals ever. He later went on to rule on Marbury v. Madison, which effectively established the court's role as we know it today to rule on the legislature as constitutional or not, which wasn't written until before that. It wasn't the last of the radical fallout from the 1800 election. Aaron Burr would eventually go on to kill Hamilton in a duel in 1803. At this point, duels were not uncommon, and this is actually Burr's 12th duel, I think if I remember, 11th or 12th, there were rules to these duels. So duels are called after someone insulted someone else, and some states allowed dueling and others didn't. Where an Aaron Burr killed Hamilton, they actually had to leave New York, cross the river to go to New Jersey, where dueling was legal, which isn't that surprising. Talk about determination, though, to go to a different state just to duel someone. Before the duel, the accuser, the person who levied the insult, would have was asked to apologize. If he did not, the duel would continue. The first round was always fired into the air, and then the person was, at, was asked to apologize again. If they did not, then the duel would continue. And after that, after every shot, the person could still pull back their insult or whatever it was that they said, but it was not that uncommon for people to duel out their issues, which would make people today think twice before they called someone an insult if they may have to put their life on the line for it. The big takeaway from the Revolution of 1800, as it's called, is this was the first peaceful transition of power from differing parties in the U.S. Both these men wanted to take the United States in vastly different directions. It was effectively a regime change, a peaceful regime change, one of their first kinds in the modern world today. There was no civil war, and the Union was preserved. I still just love how someone insults another person to the point where they stand by it so much, they're willing to go into a duel by pistols. I assume it was pistols based on Hollywood and some historical events. Yeah, black powder pistols. Those, I mean, people might think just because they're not rifled barrels that those aren't accurate. I mean, they could still, they could, I mean, there are still things called squirrel guns back then for a reason. You could still shoot a squirrel pretty good from a pretty good distance. I you're only 20 paces away, which is, that's about, depending on your pace. Mm, 60 feet? Well, actually, my pace, 13 and a half paces for me is 66 feet. Okay. Unless they, depends what they call a pace. In forestry, a pace is uh, once one foot touches down. So if I take a step with my right foot and then with my left, that's one pace. And then when I take another step with my right foot and then my left, that's another pace. That's what I assume, but I'm also taller than the average bear. So back then, I imagine them being slightly shorter on average because of malnutrition. Probably had a little bit shorter paces, so it was probably under 60 feet if I had to imagine. That's true. Everyone was a lot shorter back then. But I'd be okay with that. If we brought back duels and you had to stand by your insult, I I might just start insulting certain people just to have a duel with them. <laughs> if it's If it's egotistic for me to say that, but it's true. Yep. And that's what some people did. Like... I can't remember whether it was Burr or Hamilton, but they were famous for insulting people, challenging them to a duel just to intimidate them to backing down and destroy their credibility. Like I said, Burr and Hamilton, I think, led to this divisive and just unclean politics that we see today. Now, not that Adams and Jefferson were, were free of guilt at all. I mean, Adams passed the Alien and Sedition Act, a violation of the First Amendment, which was, like I said, the ink was barely dry. Like, they just finished writing the Bill of Rights, and then they censored speech. Yes, we tend to heroize the people of our past, not realize they were human just like me and you and everyone else in today's society. 
No one was perfect, and a lot of them were hypocritical, did hypocritical things, or were not what we thought they were in the light, but in the shadows they showed their true colors. But it is funny to me, Nick, the entire time you were telling the story of how much I could see this happening in the 20th and 21st century, let alone this was happening like decades after us winning against the British in the Revolutionary War. It's just humans never change. We never learn, do we? No, we don't. And I wanted to bring this topic up nearing election time. I wanted people to realize this country has been divided before and some would say more divided back then, like very real differences in how we wanted this country run. If you look at what Adams and the Federalists wanted versus Jefferson, and the Republicans wanted, there's two different nations. The ideas we're espousing today are closer than what those two wanted. And those people back then were not tied together the way we are as a country today. They were states. They were Virginians, New Yorkers. You were, Yeah, they were, in effect, these United States of America. Even when traveling to France, they would greet people as, I'm a Georgian. It wasn't, I'm from the United States. It was what state they were from. They had in each state was different. They had differences between states more so than we do today. And they shared, states shared more I ideas. Yes, some states are more likely to vote for certain things, and each state today has a personality. There's a difference between California and Texas, but you can move between any state in this nation. It's going to be relatively the same, and it's probably the same back then. You can move around, and your field is probably pretty similar, but it wasn't the same. You, you would be known as an outsider. You would be the guy from New York, and you would always identify New York as your home, not as whatever state you were currently working in. Sailors taken prisoner on British ships or Fran French ships, depending on what year it was and who we had an agreement with at that time, they would write home to their states they didn't say we're united states sailors they would be i'm a sailor from pennsylvania yeah delaware and, and these states were only united for what this is their third real election i get I, I mean washington being elected who everyone was for that that was no this is the second election really second divisive election the first really divisive election in the last election jefferson and adams were still good friends and after the election of 1800 they stopped writing to each other until 1812 and i forget exactly what year but they died i think uh 14 years after 1812 so carry the one 26 yeah in 1826 they died july 4th that same day two enemies who became friends do you know what adam's last words were mike no I... he said jefferson survives jeffrey adams died the night of july 4th jefferson died the morning jefferson was dead when adams said that bounded by history and i mean they seemed more like brothers if anything else where in a fight they got each other's back but at the dinner table they want to kill each other out of curiosity, Nick, I have a question for you. Uh, you wouldn't happen to know when researching, because you said they rather raised this being they being the early colonists for America, saying they rather raise money to fight a war against the French rather than pay homage to the French for backslandering them, et cetera, et cetera. Did how did the French just like ignore America at this point? Because I know in the War of eighteen twelve, the French end up helping us again against the British. So I'm curious how we bridged that gap and helped unite us again before when they were angry at us for not helping them with again, with their war against the British. So we were friends with the French up until that up until Jay's Treaty, where we were not supported but made a deal with the English, which they didn't like. And then after this, there was a lot of anti-French sentiment. But what happened is Napoleon needed allies to fight the English in 1812, from what I understand, France, uh, the French, basically were the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And when we got involved with the British again, they were going to support us because they just hate the British so much. <laughs> it's weird how hatred can sometimes be generational. And also weird how much Napoleon loved George Washington. Yeah. And I think, yeah, the French and British hatred would, would might make an interesting podcast sometime. I think it's important to remember Jefferson for the things that he did too. I'm not try I'm not an anti Jefferson guy. I I do love the ideals Jefferson espoused. I mean, Jefferson got us the Louisiana purchase. <laughs> we would not be the country we are today without that. I mean he did a lot of other great things as well, but that yeah, but it's uh and the thing is, there was a lot of 
tension at the time between Adams and J- Jefferson. Like we mentioned, Adams appointing all those judges, what would later become to known as the Midnight Judges. But there really wasn't retribution. Adams and Jefferson got along after, but there was no going after the other guy. Jefferson didn't come after all the Federalists in office. And tensions still there, but went away a little bit after the election. Everything kind of calmed down. Besides Burr and Hamilton, who I'm not sad that Burr killed Hamilton. I'm just, just going to say it. I don't, not a huge fan of Burr either, but not a huge fan of either of those two. They're behind the scenes, creating tension, doing backdoor deals. Those two guys are more similar to the modern day politicians. What's funny is one of my, I was listening to Lindsey Graham's podcast and Lindsey Graham was probably the only guy who had nice things to say about Burr and Hamilton. It's like, well, <laughs> politicians, right? Never change. True, but. What I gather from that story is united we stand, divided we fall. We all want the same things in life, rather which side of the fence you stand on, and there's more in common than there is difference. I think that's important to realize that that's a, that's a golden rule that will last throughout the times of all humanity history and the future. There are more common things amongst ourselves than there are differences even in 1800s when they're dueling each other out of curiosity nick do duels still exist here in the united states i wish i don't think so right mean me and you international water let's go oh another trip out to international <laughs> waters i want to end this segment with a quote that applies to that time a little earlier and definitely to now and to the end of this country our country started with this quote and it will most likely end with this quote we must hang together or surely we shall hang separately. Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up, so let us know what we forgot. And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on Instagram and Backyard Philosophy Podcast on Facebook.